Hi, welcome back. So glad you could join us today. Today we're going to do something a little different. So while they run all the colors you need to paint along with me down at the bottom of the screen, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Instead of painting our own little world, today we're going to paint some of the images and symbols found in Andean textiles. I found these particular symbols used in some of the textiles that my friends and I brought back from our trip to Peru, and I think you're really going to like them. And while I paint, instead of telling you about the painting specifically, I'm actually going to talk about some of the things I learned about Andean textiles. So while they run all the topics, I'll talk to you about it at the bottom of the screen. Come over here, and I'll show you what I have. Here we have our standard old pre-stretched canvas, but it's a very small one, an 8x8, because we're going to be making three different paintings. The first one we'll be making is from this hat that Dr. Riddle bought in Chawatiri. Isn't that a lovely hat? I bet you it'll keep you real warm. I'll be painting some of the middle part with the wheels and flowers. Now I've got a picture of that part of the hat right here for reference. Now, before I start each of these paintings, I want to tell you about the meanings of the symbols I'm painting. Let me show you what I've got in this hat. Here I've got these wheels and these flowers. The wheels you can see with the different sections is called the Wheel of the Six Fertile Lands, and it represents the six key crops that Quechua peoples grow year-round, including quinoa, corn, and potato. And this little flower is the, flower, uh, is the potato flower. It shows the dependency of the Indian people on growing potatoes. Did you know there are over 2,400 varieties of potatoes grown there? That's really something. So now that I've told you what we're going to do today, let's go ahead and get started. We'll have some fun. So, I don't know if you can see my canvas right now, but I've already got outlines of what I'm going to do since I'm really not much of a, a painter to begin with. Um, and I've got them outlined in the colors that I'm going to do them in. Now normally we would try to pick what color to start with, but instead I think we'll start at the top left corner here with this red. Alright, so. I decided to start with this painting because Dr. Riddle's hat is very special. It's part of the traditional outfit worn by the men in Chawatiri, which is the town where she got it. So since I'm starting with a piece of traditional dress, I can start this little feature talking about the importance of weaving and textiles and traditional dress to per Peruvian culture from ancient Andes to modern Peru. Now, the ancient Andeans have had a special interest with textiles for millennia, even long before the Inca Empire. It encompassed all aspects of their life, from animal husbandry and agriculture to raise the materials used to make the cloth, to the growing and gathering of different plants and bugs to make the colored dyes, the spinning and weaving, and the, the finalizing the cloth, and then tailoring and stitching it into garments. It was in everything they did, so it became a very important part of Andean culture. Cloth was one of the most highly valued gifts you could receive, and it was used prominently in different coming-of-age ceremonies. It's kind of like getting really nice clothes for your birthday. Now, cloth could also be used politically as part of trades between conquered or incorporated regions in the Inca Empire. The conquered region had to produce cloth for the Inca state and religion, and in return the Inca gave the regional nobility ceremonial gifts of this very very nice kind of cloth called kumbi, which was the most highly valued kind of textile you could receive. And only the Inca was allowed to wear or give out this kind of cloth. Traditional dress could also have social and political meaning. Every region or ethnic group had its own style of dress. The Inca used this fact to keep order and distinction between different ethnic groups and social classes. They actually considered wearing a different province's traditional dress uh, to be a serious offense because it made provincial control more difficult. Dress could also show social class, but interestingly it wasn't the clothing or the clothing design itself that denoted between the different classes, but the material it was made out of. The Inca and nobility used a richer, more lavish fabric like that kumbi I mentioned earlier, uh, while everyone else used a coarser fabric called abasca.
after the Spanish conquest, the native Indians weren't allowed to carry out many of their traditions, including their traditions of dress. In fact, traditional clothes were modified by a series of laws and ordinances governing their design. At the same time, clothing associated with royalty were incorporated into the more theatrical aspects of Andean colonial life. They were used intentionally in public presentations and of an Inca identity that was sanctioned by the church and political officials. So it was worn at festivals and feasts like Corpus Christi or the Divine Child, which we actually saw while we were in uh, Cusco. That was really neat to see. Nowadays there's been a lot more interest in preserving Andean textile traditions. And places like Chinchero and Chavatiri are keeping those traditions alive by raising alpaca and llamas to make their own wool and, and to weave it and making their own dyes and stuff like that. It's really, really was amazing to see. Alright. Just gotta keep doing this. It's gonna take a little while. While I do this, why don't I show you some videos and pictures I got while we were in a Chinchero and Chawatiri. So you can see what it looked like when they were showing us all the different things they did to to make their textiles. I have a couple pictures of the uh, the lady weavers of Chinchero. That woman in the middle was the one who, uh, who gave us the basically the tour around of the place that so we were sitting in one place the whole time. She told us how everything works from the beginning of the process to the end. It was a lot of fun. Here you can see the uh, woman spinning and she was telling us about how they, the women spin no matter what they do all the time, all day. And uh, here you can see it was. She also told us about how they um, how they dye the wool, and it's really interesting how they can use kind of a few different dye colors, but then they can change the tone of it using stuff like salt water. And in this picture here, she was dipping a, a deep red dyed wool into some some I think it was I think it was salt water maybe some other kind of mineral in it. When it came out, it was this really bright red. Really gorgeous. And uh, here's a really fun picture. The woman sitting and she's using a, an old weaving uh, loom, I believe it is, to uh, put together a textile. It's really, really neat to see. And now we have to try to mix orange for this wheel and this flower, which should be interesting because when I was practicing earlier, the, the mix came out looking a little weird. So, wish me luck here. Some yellow. A little more yellow. That's probably about as close as we're going to get to an orange. It'll have to do. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be fun. That's all that matters. Now here we have something really fun and exciting to see. It's a video of the man using a using the loom and uh, you can see how he's using it to really really weave it tight really just put in the design and put in real tight i don't know much about weaving on obviously so i don't know how much i can tell you about what exactly he's doing but it looks like really delicate work i believe they told us that that long string of stuff that he made took three months which is just so impressive really beautiful I'll let that run so you can just listen to the guy. And that's that's Miguel. He was our he was our tour guide. Really great guy. Very very nice because the people in Chawatiri they still speak Quechua, which is the the language of the ancient Indian people. Which is really neat. Not only keeping textile traditions alive, they're also keeping the old language alive. Chawatiri. The people were so nice. So these these petals on the on the potato flower have a really interesting design in the weaving. They look like it's it's a little loops with a 
large black center. Now, I couldn't quite make that look good. So I'm taking a little bit of an artistic liberty with how I'm representing it in this painting here. I've got a little center where they're connected and in the, in the centers of each of the petals I'm making little centers, little loops. So hopefully that looks good. I like it. I like having a one side thinner than the other so it looks like it's on the inside of the loop. Yeah, I like that. That's good. Straighten that out a little bit. There we go. Gotta be careful around the edges. Don't wanna run into each other. There we go. Nice and even. Get the center. Maybe the center is where they have meetings. Give little daily petal reports. How's the potato growing today? Oh, it's growing real good. I think we'll have a good crop this year. Well, that's good. Good potato crops are important. People gotta eat, you know? That's good. Now we're gonna move on to the last part of this painting, and that's gonna be these bands in the middle separating that. That won't be too hard. That'll just be two larger colors uh, and some stripes down. I'm gonna use a bigger brush for that so that it's Maybe not that big. That'll do. I can use this brush. It'll be, uh, be pretty quick. What colors am I using? Ooh. Looks like yellow for this bottom band here. Right there. When you're painting big bands like this, and you want to make sure that you have the top like that, it's easiest to avoid making strange thick lines if you Pull down the paint from the top, just like that. There we go. There we go. I gotta wash the brush. The water's over here. Sorry, you can't see it. Alright. I'm gonna beat the devil out of it. There we go. Next. I'm going to use that weird pinkish orange again for this other strip here. Hopefully it's not too dry. Let's see. Ooh, might have to mix a little more of that. There we go. It doesn't work if you don't make the noise. And across the bottom as well. Let's get some more paint on the edge of the brush. And a little more. There we go. Okay. Now those lines are green on the top and black on the bottom. So we'll start. Start with the top. We'll start with the green. We'll just do a line across the. Actually, no. We'll start with the black. Since that'll be a little more dry. That's fine. There we go. Not too worried about the colors. Just start with a line across here, and that should actually help even out some of the mistakes as well. Yeah. And give the brush a little tilt to make it a little thicker. There we go. My hand's not as steady as I wish it were. Lines are a little wavy. But well, it's alright. That's good. Now I'll do lines down and just tilt the, tilt the brush just a little bit. Just like that. Fun to read the brush. 
Now the green again. Here we go. Let's see. Mine across the top. There we go. It's a little more green. Right across there. Make it a little thicker. Make it mesh the bottom a little bit better. make a mistake, don't spend too much time trying to fix it. Might just end up making it worse. Sometimes things happen and that's alright. Nothing's perfect. Yeah. It's like life is like that too. Don't do all the mistakes. Just try to find the good in them. And even if there is none. Sometimes the best thing you can do is move on to the next project. Ooh. Good one. It's alright. There we go. I think we can call that done. We'll move on to the next painting now. Alright, now we're going to start the next painting. Now this painting we're going to do is on the textile that my friend Shailen bought in Chowaterian. We'll show you what that looks like now. That's a picture of the bag that she bought and we'll be painting those birds. This would be a lot of fun. Now, let me show you what I've already started here. As you can see, I've already done the base layer of colors for this one, and I've let it dry since we're working with acrylics. Now, the colors don't look exactly like the weaving, but that's alright. I'm mixing colors by eye, and I'm not a great painter to begin with. To be fair, though, I'm sure no two colors are the same when the weavers dye their wool, either. That's the special thing about art. No two pieces are the same. And the important thing about art is that, no matter what medium you enjoy it and have fun. That's all. I am very much enjoying this opportunity to appreciate this amazing art by spending some time with the designs and learning some interesting things about them. Now, I've just started and I'll tell you what we're doing and we'll have some fun today. So, this is going to be an interesting one because it's mostly lines and Every time I cross into another part of this color, the color and the lines change. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the ends and work inward. And, and then I'm going to paint over just a little bit so that when I paint the next row, I can paint over it. And it'll look a little more consistent. But I'm going to go ahead and get started on this next topic. Now, this next topic is about the importance of um, symbols in Indian culture. These symbols in particular, I'll tell you, these birds are condors. Condors are very important symbols in weaving because they are very important in Andean mythology. Condors, they in Andean mythology, represent the sun, the sky, and the upper world, where God, the moon, and sun, and the souls of the dead live. There are a lot of myths surrounding condors, such as that when weavers use picks made of condor bones, their fingers fly in the picking out the designs. Now that, that explanation, that's a pretty good transition into this topic, I think. Um, so the use of symbolism in textiles, in both ancient and modern Andean textile. Okay. Andeans have used symbols to show a lot of things, but one of the biggest themes that they focus on in their weaving is that of nature. Andean cultures have this amazing relationship with the natural environment. They don't really see humans as separate from nature. That's why you get so many different symbols relating to nature and farming and things like that. Additionally, for Quechua people, nature includes the supernatural, especially transitional images that bridge worlds. Alright, where was I? Ah, Indian cosmology. Indian cosmology is organized around sky, earth, and water. 
deities that weavers often include in their textiles, such as our condor friends here. Condors represent the sky, like I said. Well, felines represent the earth, and water is represented by either serpents or toads. That's a weird thing to think about for us, but they're all very important animals in Indian cosmology. Right. Now we'll do this side, just to make it a little easier on ourselves. Now, I mentioned water being important in Indian cosmology. And water symbols are especially significant because water is 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 sorry, is vital. Forgot the word for a second there. Water is vital to life and some of the rituals that are practiced by the Indian peoples. So motifs can communicate a whole a whole bunch of information about space and time and history and accounting and so much more. Now, as to why people use motifs in, in their textiles, it's, it's so that they can read that information. It's a sort of record keeping. Quite a pretty way to keep records, I think. Uh, all of those images symbolize cultural concepts. Now, here. Some of these images can even have double meanings. For example, the Nazca people, in, a, in one textile that was found, used a pattern of beans to represent the importance of farming. And you'd think, oh, that's pretty cool. They must have been farmer people, and they were. But that's not all that those beans represented. Because beans in the Nazca imagery was interchangeable with severed heads, if you can believe it. And uh, I think I'm done with the red on that side. Sorry. Was well, severed heads? Severed heads um in the Nazca culture were used interchangeably because there was this Nazca ritual where they buried severed heads in order to ensure their water supply. Now, since the Nazca were a desert culture. The water was of particular importance to them. And the Nazca aren't quite Andean, but I thought it was an interesting example. You can see just how important these symbols are and how they're used. When it comes to reading the images and symbols and all of this, not everyone can do it, which I suppose isn't really a surprise if you consider how intricate they can be. The ability to read a lot of these images is limited to a couple of people. Sometimes the weavers themselves know what it means, as, as you would if you were the one creating the image. But those meanings are passed down through oral tradition. And oral tradition can be particular to a culture, or a village, or even a single family. Now, they can also be understood by people like shamans who understand deeper cultural meanings behind symbols, and how symbols might represent different things. But like I said, sometimes images can also be specifically connected to particular villages. So, the meaning of a symbol in one village might not be the same as the meaning of an image in a different village. 
makes it a little harder to interpret them. Oh, well, next I think we'll do... We're going to save this one for last, actually, since I'll have to mix some colors together for that one. So next we're going to do this one here, since that, that's connected. That's going to be white. Excuse me while I wash this brush. Now, we're making two of them. And that's just because we think that this condor needs a friend, which of course it does. Everyone deserves a friend. But also because the idea of, of dualism, this repeated mirrored pattern, is, is very important in Andean symbolism. Yeah. Dualism is everywhere. That's okay. have a little more of that color. That's alright, that's bound to happen. Just little details. Probably dry that brush. It's like watercolors. <laughs> Whoops. Oh well. Dualism is, is actually a central principle concept not only in weaving and symbolism, but it actually structures the Quechua world and life within it. It's part of how they perceive reality, which is really interesting, especially considering some of the things that they perceive in that dualism. Stuff like the dichotomy between the sun and the moon, or the male and female. Actually, a, a lot of stuff that they do represent also represents that dichotomy between male and female. For example, the, the sun and the moon I just mentioned. The sun is meant to represent the male, but the female is represented by the moon. And that shows up all over the place. Having more than one other thing can mean different things as well, like I said. The meaning of symbols varies wildly from place to place. It just means that everyone's story is different. A little unique. It's interesting, this idea of, I mentioned earlier, record keeping with symbols. It's very similar to the uh, method of record keeping that the Inca used overall. I can't remember what it's called. It starts with a Q. They used the knotted, weaved braids to keep counts and number of things, and I assume the quality of different materials, but it's, it's not anything that we understand how to interpret. Maybe someday we'll be able to see what they were talking about. That'd be quite the achievement. Tell what they kept where and stuff like that. Right, let's get this beak. Ooh, it's a delicate beak. We'll use just the just the edge of the brush. Let's get that more fine point. Here we go. Nice right, and easy. Let's fill it in. Yeah, fill it in. I'll move on to his friend. There we go. Right. I'm trying to think of more to say on the symbolism. There's just so much, and at the same time, not very much at all since I don't. I did all that research on it, and I can't tell you much about it because it's so different in every place. Importance is the same everywhere, though. I don't think I've ever seen a, any Andean, any Andean 
piece of textile without some symbols on it. Even the tourist stuff with little llamas on it. The poncho I got my sister. I think she likes it. It's nice and warm. Too bad it's spring now. Not much use for it. That's just the time we visited. That's fine. Last color. It's actually coming out pretty well, I think. Perhaps I shouldn't act so surprised. But I'm glad I'm doing this. I'm having a lot of fun. Alright. This last one's going to be this light greenish color. That's fine. Here we go. I'm not boring you all. Just don't have much to say at this point, I guess. But we're almost done with this one and then we'll move on and I'm sure I'll have more things to show you. Tore and messed up, maybe a little bit. That's fine. Bring up the beak. The bird flew into the window of our house the other day, and I went out to go look at it to see if it was still alive, and it was, thank goodness. It was just sitting there trying to catch its breath. Poor thing. Lost a couple feathers on the window. Alright, I think that's done. Now, after this, we'll just do one more painting, and then I think we'll call it a day. Now, we finally got to this last one. And I think this one is probably going to end up being a little more simple. So, just like the last time, I've gone ahead and done the base layer and let it dry. Now, I don't have a picture of the image I'm painting because I actually have it uh, right here with me. Excuse me for a second. Give me my back. Here, let me hold it up so you can see. I got this bag in Chalatiri. I'm going to paint this symbol right here in the middle. Mostly be I chose this one because it's the only one I had a good idea of what it might be. Like I said earlier, there's not many people that can give the exact cultural meaning of these symbols. I should have asked while we were still in Chalatiri, but oh well. Now, that swirling pattern in the middle there is the puma's paw print. It represents where the puma had once been. I said before, felines, and especially puma in Andean cosmology, represent the earth and the world where the Quechua people live. As for the diamond, well, I'm not entirely sure. But it could symbolize a lake, with the thing in the center meaning the lake is fruitful. That interpretation I'm definitely shaky on. We'll do this one pretty quick, I think. In this section, my topic was the meaning of symbols. Now, I've kind of been doing that this whole time by telling you about the meaning of symbols I've been painting. So, I'm trying to think. What else I can say? There's so many different symbols in so many different meanings for each symbol, but I'd like to encourage you to try to find ways, if, if you have a textile at home that is Andean or that you think may have some meaning, I want to encourage you to, to look it up yourself, to try to find out what it means. There's a lot of fun in, in exploring the things that you, you have and the, the culture that it's connected to. Now this, this textile also has a couple heart patterns tried to look up what they meant as well. Uh, the heart patterns I found online are a little different than the ones I found online. But in general, hearts can be a symbol of the, the status of the weaver's relationships. One heart, or I'm sorry, half a heart, can mean that the weaver is single. Well, a whole heart might mean that they're married. It's a pretty cool way to show something really individualist. 
a little personal touch almost. Because it'll be almost different from each person to person. Let's see. Right. Now, since I've kind of been doing this section the whole time, I don't have much to say, but there is something else I'd like to share with you. And that's, you probably guessed at this point, all the, the animals that me and my friends met while we were in Peru. I don't have any videos of them, but I have some pictures I think you'll really like. Because the animals were just so sweet and there were so many of them. So I'll go ahead and let you see see those while I keep working on this. There are a lot of really sweet animals in Peru. I will start by talking about some of the dogs we saw. Here's a picture. That's a lot of fun. It was hot. It was the summer season while we were there and there were there's a lot of dogs in Peru. And sometimes we saw them lying around in the shade like this. Now all those dogs, they might look like strays, but they're not. In a, in a, South, a lot of South American countries, actually. Uh, the, the dogs, they are allowed to run around during the day, and they always go back home for food, but none of the dogs we saw were strays, which is really nice. I also saw a couple of dogs at some of the train stations, especially in Oyatatambo. Here's one. We met him at the beginning of the day. He was so nice. Came up to me and let me pet him a lot. And now when we came back at the end of the day, I had some bits of empanada in my pocket. And these two dogs followed me and kept nosing at my pocket trying to get at the leftover meat. And I wasn't sure if I should give it to them, but then Dr. Bennett stopped and gave him a cracker from the train ride, and I figured, well, I suppose it's alright then. They certainly seemed happy to get a treat. Here's a picture of me with one of them. I was taken by a friend of mine, JJ. Of course, those weren't the only kind of animals we saw. We did see a couple of llamas and alpacas, and here's a, so one picture from Chinchero. We had to feed the uh, llamas and alpacas there. They're so soft. Such nice things. You can tell that one's an alpaca because it's got, it's got hair around its face. Alpacas grow a lot more hair than llamas do. Or llamas, sorry. <laughs> we also saw a lot of guinea pigs. Now that's because Guinea pigs are eaten in Peru. They actually, in the, in the ancient Inca Empire, they used to be a delicacy. So we saw a lot of them, and, and in this picture here, that was an, a traditional Inca home. We actually got to feed a lot of them. A lot of places that we were in, if they had guinea pigs, it was a, they weren't really in a, in a pen that was completely closed, so you would see them running around on the floor. And, it was a lot of fun. They certainly were cute. Well, our time is up. I want to thank you for being so good as to sit and enjoy these textiles with us, and for learning a little bit about the traditions and symbolisms behind Andean textiles. I certainly had a lot of fun, and I really hope you did too. And from all of us here, I want to wish you a happy painting, and God bless you, my friends. Just a gorgeous little painting.